Well, the next speaker is not here, but we have taped him uh, because he was giving a lecture yesterday in, in Italy where we are basically uh, running the same, the same meeting. Um, he's Dagan Wells and he's the laboratory director of Repregenetics UK and assistant professor uh, in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Oxford. Uh, Dagan Wells studied at the University College of London where he obtained his doctoral degree in genetics and he has been actively involved in PGD uh, and in the study of human gametes and embryos uh, for two decades and conducted his first uh, PGD uh, in 1992. Um, I look now uh, quite wise in having recruited him at St. Barnabas because he's one of the, the brightest stars in PGD. Uh, he initi initiated it at Reprogenetics or, or um, single gene defects um, group and Dagan later uh, he joined uh, Yale University um, and from there uh, moved to Oxford University uh, where he's now as I said uh, one of the professors there. Uh, Dagan current research program uh, is focused on increasing understanding of the molecular genetics process underlying uh, gametogenesis and implementation development. Uh, his laboratory has a strong uh, translational emphasis and is actively involved in the development of new products and methods for PGD. Uh, Dr. Wells is one of the most um, renowned uh, scientists, as I said. Uh, his work has been recognized with several prizes, including the American Society of Reproductive Medicine Prize, General Prize in 2000, and he has published over uh, 80 papers. Uh, his research recently um, has uh, led to the first baby born after um, next gen sequencing and therefore his, uh, his talk is going to be about the future of PGD and a new aspect. Thanks very much Chris and thanks very much to Luca and all the others who've put this together. It's been, it's been a lot of fun, really interesting, so thank you for that. Uh, I should disclose that as well as what Chris mentioned, of course I do also direct the Reprogenetics Lab in Oxford also. So, We've had a few debates during this meeting, but I think we can all agree that IVF has been a fantastically successful medical intervention. I think we can all agree, sure, maybe not. Um, it's, of course, completely revolutionized the treatment of infertility, and as you know, it's estimated that more than five million babies have been born now worldwide. And in fact, of course, in industrialized nations, it's thought that between one and 5% of all births now come through uh, the IVF route. But I'm sure that we also will all agree that despite having this process with us for more than three decades now, it really does still remain rather inefficient. As you have already heard in previous talks, only about a third of IVF cycles worldwide actually end up producing a pregnancy. And of course, we can all see the headline results on individual clinics' websites, which would make us feel it's much more than this. But the reality is, if you put all the different kinds of patients together from all the different clinics, this is more the number you come out with. Um, part of this inefficiency is likely due to our inability to reliably choose the most viable embryo for transfer. Of course, primarily this is done in every lab around the world using morphology, but any embryologist you speak to will uh, certainly admit that while this is a guide, it's only a very rough guide. And consequently, 85% of the embryos we choose for transfer don't actually ultimately produce a baby. So the question has been, and obviously what we've been talking about mostly throughout today, has been really, could genetics provide us with an additional insight, something that goes beyond morphology and tells us about something hidden within the embryo that may affect its capacity for making a baby? Of course, this has led to the proposal of PGS, and uh, as we've heard, it's really the 20th anniversary of this whole notion since uh, Santiago Monet and others uh, first proposed it in 1993. It's something that on the surface of it, of course, the theory sounds incredibly solid and very attractive. It really is true that we produce a huge number of aneuploid oocytes as a species, probably tenfold more than most other animals that we know of. And it's really true that those kinds of aneuploidy are almost invariably lethal. So it seems sensible to make this proposal. But of course it's been very controversial through the disappointments of multiple randomized trials, as we've heard about. 
So where are we now and where are we going? Well, I think we've seen some quite encouraging data presented today. I think I certainly would agree that far more needs to be done uh, in terms of defining patient populations, coming up with better and better randomized trials to really see what, to what extent this can help. But technically is where I'm going to really take this talk and talk about some of the things that may be coming um, maybe in the not too far distant future. If we believe that a technique like PGS could help patients, then one of the important things is how can we make it accessible to those patients. At the moment, pre-implantation genetic screening is still a relatively expensive add-on to what is already an expensive procedure, IVF. So we're going to need to find ways to make this kind of information more easy to access or less expensive in accessing. And we think that one of the main ways that we could potentially achieve this is through next generation sequencing. So uh, we're going to look at this a little bit more and ask the question, we've already of course heard a bit about next generation sequencing and I'm indebted to the previous speakers for introducing that so nicely, uh, but could it help us to really overcome some of these difficulties? Next generation sequencing is a, really not just one process, but a range of different technologies which all kind of deliver the same thing and they're really revolutionizing pretty much all aspects of genetic research and also increasingly uh, genetic diagnostics as well. What they all have in common is that they generate vast quantities of DNA sequence information at a relatively low cost and pretty fast if you consider uh, the billions spent on the first human genome sequence and the years that that took to complete compared to now being able to look at an entire genome for just a few thousand euro uh, and just in, in a couple of weeks. So um, that's a major advance. Uh, Santi uh, showed a version of this slide earlier, but I think it bears repeating. Um, essentially what you do, or at least what we do when we're looking at single cells for next generation uh, sequencing, is we get the DNA out of the cell and we fragment that DNA so it's broken into lots of pieces. Each one of those fragments is then sequenced, and so uh, the actual technology will reveal the order of the nucleotides, the bases, along the length of that. So you end up with literally millions of individual fragments like this, and by themselves, you wouldn't be able to make head nor tail of them. What does it all mean? Thankfully, because we now have the full human genome sequence, a computer can do the hard work for us and compare all of these little sequences to the known human genome and tell us where does it match. So you could end up with maybe here's your human genome and the computer is going to line up all these millions of little fragments just to where they match and the computer is going to look and check that each base matches perfectly. So it tells us, first of all, where this sequence comes from in the human genome, which chromosome, which gene. It also potentially tells us if there's any difference from what we would expect in the human genome, in other words, a mutation or a polymorphism. So it's telling us potentially about uh, useful clinical information that way. At the moment, if you do a next-generation sequencing experiment, it's not actually all that cheap. It's still going to cost you, you know, maybe a thousand, couple of thousand euro or something like this. But there are ways that you can make it a lot cheaper per sample if you're not intent on collecting the entire genome's information. Now, when we're talking about PGS, we're not asking questions about individual genes. We want to just know chromosome copy number. So we don't need every single base of the human genome. We just want to get an idea of how much DNA there was from each chromosome. So the way you can do this is uh, with something that uh, Joe Lee touched upon in, in the first talk of the day, uh, looking using what's called barcodes. So here you have an example where we have three embryos, and we're going to, they each have, for a particular gene, a different sequence. And you can see that embryo number three actually has a difference in sequence here, a mutation. Now, I could look at each of these embryos separately and spend quite a lot of money doing it if I did it with next-generation sequencing, or I could throw all of their DNA together and share the cost of that next generation sequencing across the three samples, essentially dividing the cost by three, making it much cheaper. But we then need to find out which sequences came from which embryo. And we do this by, before sequencing, attaching these barcodes. They're just short DNA sequences 
that we know exactly which sequence is going with which embryo. So for embryo one, all those millions of sequences created are all going to have AAGG added to the front. For embryo number two, all those millions of sequences are going to have CCTT at the front, and so on. So we sequence these all together. We get a big mixture of fragments like this, big mixture of sequences. One of them is found to have a mutation, and we now ask the question, OK, that's great. One of the embryos had a mutation, but which one was it? It's just a simple matter of looking at the first few nucleotides and seeing that, ah, yes, that matches embryo three. So these have been analyzed together, sharing the cost, but we can still then extract the important information of which data came from which embryo. Uh, we've looked and been able to sequence up to 7 billion letters of the genetic code in individual uh, embryos, although I must say this isn't what we normally do because we're not interested in that level of detail. Uh, what we do if we want to ask the question about chromosome copy number is we literally say how many fragments came from each chromosome. And this is the kind of result we get when we look at a normal cell. So you can see that, not surprisingly, chromosome 1, the biggest chromosome, has more fragments of sequence detected than any of the others. Although you can also see that there are some surprises, maybe. Chromosome 19, for example, despite being small, gives us a lot of sequence information. Now, the reason for that is that before we do the DNA sequencing, we have to do a whole genome amplification. Uh, but that doesn't actually amplify the whole genome equally. There are certain parts that, that amplify better than others. And so you get a distortion there. So if I was treating this as a, a sample and not comparing it to anything else, I might think that I had an abnormality here on chromosome 19. But of course, that's not what we do. We get a normal cell like this, and we use it as a reference compared to what we then see in an embryo. So here's an embryo result. And you can see for most of the chromosomes, it matches very nicely exactly what we'd see in a normal cell. But you might be able to pick out that we seem to have too many sequences derived from chromosome number 22. And in fact, this was a trisomy 22 embryo. So that's kind of how it works. It's actually very simple. Uh, you know, these technologies, they're, you know, they're, they're fantastically designed. They're, they seem on the surface very complex. But our part of it is actually not all that difficult. So uh, here's just a couple of examples for you. This is a, an array CGH result, which we've seen a few of already today, so uh, hopefully we're familiar with them. It's showing the results for each of the chromosomes, one, two, three, four, and so on. And you can see that most of the clones on the microarray are clustering along this central line, meaning that, that they are normal. But you can see here that we have uh, an abnormality of this chromosome. I guess that's 22, 21, 19, so uh, trisomy 19 here. 1X chromosome, no Y chromosome. So this is trisomy 19 and also Turner's syndrome. Um, when we looked at this same embryo using a separate biopsy and did next generation sequencing, uh, this is the result we got. Uh, and this was actually done on a MySeq, so that's the system from Illumina. Uh, and you can see again, all the chromosomes being pretty much equal, but a very clear three copies detected of chromosome 19 uh, one copy of the X chromosome and no Y. So you can see the results are actually very clear and easy to interpret. Uh, we've also, using a different platform, uh, the Iron Torrent PGM um, from Life Technologies, done two uh, clinical cycles. Of course, we did a lot of preclinical validation. We've looked at well over 100 different embryos now. Um, but uh, once we were happy with the accuracy rate, we went ahead just to see whether this could fit in a clinical scenario. Uh, so these cycles were done at New York University with Jamie Griffo and also mainline fertility uh, with Michael Glasner there. Um, these were infertile patients. Their primary risk was just due to elevated maternal age, so increased risk of miscarriage and Down syndrome for that reason. Uh, they had a total of seven embryos biopsied at the blastocyst stage, next generation sequencing analysis to establish chromosome copy number. Um, we got results from all of them, and actually this is pretty much what we've seen in the 100 or so embryos that we did prior to this, that really you get results from almost all embryos. As long as the whole genome amplification works, you, you always get a result, uh, and the accuracy is really quite exceptional, we think. Uh, they each had a single euploid embryo transfer, and uh, a baby was born in May of 2013, which we reported at ESHRA. Uh, a second baby is due to be born any time now. Um, so 
what else can we look at? That's the PGS side, but of course we are getting some DNA sequence data. Uh, can we actually use that diagnostically, perhaps if the couple also carried a single gene disorder? Well, using our initial protocol, the answer is no. And actually, I'm quite happy about that. I'm not keen to have too many incidental findings. Uh, so we were quite happy with very low coverage of the human genome. But in cases where you had a family who knew they were at risk for a particular disorder, you could potentially look for it if you enrich that area of the genome uh, using uh, just regular DNA amplification via PCR prior to sequencing. Um, so. A couple of words to say about that. Although you can look at the DNA sequence, um, don't think that this will eliminate allele dropout, one of the principal reasons for uh, diagnostic errors when looking at individual sequences. It, it won't, and so you're still going to have to look using linked markers as well to back up your diagnosis. Obviously, doing this at the blastocyst stage is going to uh, give you less allele dropout, though, so that may be worth considering. Uh, here's a result looking at the cystic fibrosis gene. Now, this is showing you the whole enrichment idea. Each one of these gray bars that you can see here represents one fragment of sequence that's been generated and then stuck on the human genome. So this is chromosome 7, where the cystic fibrosis gene is. And you can see that there's a few bits of sequence here and there, but most of the genome hasn't been sequenced at all. But what we had done was enrich the, just the area that contains the delta F508 mutation. And you can see here that there are multiple sequences covering that area. Here's a zoomed in view. And again, you can see each of these gray bars represents a bit of that sequence. And you can see quite clearly this gap. That's the delta F508 mutation, the most common uh, three-base pair deletion that causes cystic fibrosis. So showing that you can combine these two things together. As well as getting the actual nuclear DNA sequence, of course you generate uh, sequences from the mitochondrial genome too. And this may well prove to be useful uh, in terms of diagnosis of mitochondrial DNA disorders, but maybe also has some relevance in terms of embryo selection. I won't go into that in great detail uh, today, uh, although we do have a presentation about that at the ASRM uh, where we'll talk about that in, in quite a lot of detail. Um, we've taken single cells, though, from a cell line with, that had a known mitochondrial DNA mutation just to see, as a proof of principle, to what extent uh, we could get information on this. And as well as giving us the information on the chromosomes, we found that this actually worked very nicely in terms of detecting the mutation and also gave us an idea of how many copies uh, of the mitochondrial genome, what proportion of the mitochondria were actually affected. Here's the kind of result we get uh, in a normal cell. And again, the gray bars just representing individual fragments of sequence. Here's the mitochondrial genome across the top. And you can see we're covering it multiple times with lots and lots of fragments, showing us that the whole genome is there. Uh, this is what we got from the cell that we were looking at. And you can see that in places, they have the full genome. But in other parts, there's a big gap. And this is actually a mitochondrial DNA deletion. So part of the genome is missing. So essentially, this is what it's showing us in cartoon form. You can see that for most of the genome, we've got nice coverage. All of it's there. But then there's this big bit missing. Uh, and we can also see that actually it's affecting about 80% of the mitochondria that have it. But there is a residual population that do have the full mitochondrial genome. So this could give us quite useful information diagnostically um, in terms of uh, the risk for any individual who had this kind of problem. I'll just take a, pr a brief departure from the next generation sequencing just to very quickly say something about combining PGD and PGS. So we've already talked about it in terms of next-gen sequencing, uh, but another uh, way to do this, which is really very much on the horizon now, in fact, I think people will be starting with this in the next couple of months, uh, is using the carrier mapping approach, which was proposed by Alan Handyside over at the Bridge Clinic in London. Um, so as you know, this, uh, as you probably know, this essentially is a, a linkage analysis. You look at many polymorphisms, uh, a bit like what we heard about in the previous talk. So you, if you look at these polymorphisms on the chromosomes, essentially you can get a DNA fingerprint for each bit of chromosome. So you could uh, have a look, and maybe these are two parents. I've colored in their different chromosomes just to make them easier to follow. Maybe this individual has this series of polymorphisms along the length of this chromosome. 
Uh, and this series of alleles along the other chromosome, and then their partner will have potentially different alleles. Now, if they create, uh, maybe they've got a, a mutation here on this blue chromosome. Now, if they create an embryo together, we can look at these polymorphisms and see which alleles they have at each site. So how does that help us? Well, if we look carefully, we can find key polymorphisms which are indicative of a particular chromosome being present. For example, an A at this position and a B at this position only occurs on this blue chromosome. None of the other chromosomes have that. Similarly, so this means that the blue chromosome must be present. Similarly, the B here and an A here is only found on the green chromosome. So without ever looking at the mutation itself, uh, we now know that there's a blue and a green chromosome, and we know that the blue one carries the mutation. So it's given us an indirect way of detecting that mutation. Now, uh, that's very useful because there are polymorphisms like this in the vicinity of every gene. So rather than doing what we do now in PGD, which is to develop patient-specific protocols over and over again, spending a lot of time, a lot of money developing protocols which often we'll only ever use once, um, keeping the patients waiting, of course, while all of this is going on, uh, you can actually come up with a much more generic approach, something that with within a week of workup, you could apply to a couple, allowing them to come through very quickly and at lower cost. Um, so that's, I think, a, a big advance uh, in this area. Now, of course, the theme of this meeting really is PGS, but this kind of approach allows us to get that kind of information as well, simultaneously. It's always been a bit problematic in the past, in the days when people were doing fish uh, for chromosome analysis, then com combining fish and PCR was always very difficult. Um, but this really gives you the same, uh, all the information together. Um, just, again, a cartoon to summarize that. Here's the two parental chromosomes. We've identified them as being different by looking at these uh, fingerprints of different polymorphisms along their length. Maybe these two have mutations. And we just look in the different embryos and see which ones they'd inherited. And sometimes you'll see a pattern a bit like this, where during meiosis, these two parental chromosomes have recombined. So you may see uh, some slightly more complex patterns like that. So we might see a bunch of embryos produced by this couple. And what we're really initially interested in is what's happening in the vicinity of that, mu that, that gene uh, that's interesting here in this family. And so any time the white chromosome is there, we know there's a mutation. Similarly, every time the yellow chromosome is there, we know there's a mutation. And so we can follow that logic all the way through to quickly get a diagnosis of these different embryos. That's great. But you may also see sometimes something like this, where you have the fingerprints of three different chromosomes present in an embryo, or maybe just one chromosome is present. And so essentially you're getting that aneuploidy information as well. So, uh, what about future directions? Uh, well, um, as I say, the next generation sequencing has been proved in principle. Uh, I'm happy to say that we have ethics already submitted for a funded randomized controlled trial. So, uh, people will be happy that uh, that should go ahead. Uh, so, we're having that fully reviewed, and that's the data that that generates is going to be independently reviewed also. Um, so hopefully that will get us to the basis of whether this is really hoping. We think it will, but let's wait and see. Um, at the moment, of course, all the PGS methods that we use do involve, to some degree, an invasive procedure. Uh, even if we're talking about polar bodies, of course, that's still, to some extent, invasive. Um, can time-lapse analysis get us to revealing uh, aneuploidy? We've already heard that talked about a little. My gut feeling is that for some of the highly mosaic embryos, how could there not be an impact on the cell cycle? So I think very likely they may be able to pick up those with quite a good accuracy. But for a meiotic error, giving you a Down syndrome embryo, I doubt it will have any effect. So I think it may have a role, and it may allow us to test fewer embryos, because some may be clearly abnormal and never really need an invasive test. Again, that should reduce costs, which can only be a good thing. Um, what about the omics approaches, proteomics, transcriptomics? Uh, we've heard about different possibilities of looking in the medium around the embryo. Is it uh, excreting something that indicates it's in trouble or maybe using something up from its environment uh, in an unusual way? Um, our particular approach on this 
um, has been to really focus on the cumulus cells uh, and to look, at, because of their close association with the oocyte, and because, of course, the oocyte is the principal source of aneuploidy. And so we've looked at the transcriptomic profiles, in other words, all the expressed sequences uh, of quite a few different cumulus cell samples from eggs that we had tested for aneuploidy by looking with uh, array CGH either uh, at their two polar bodies. Um, so what we found, um, and Christina already showed this earlier, is that there are a couple of genes that do look like they're telling us something about the risk of aneuploidy. However, one thing I would say about this is a bit like morphology, it's not a black or white diagnosis. At the moment, only the invasive tests give us that. This is telling us a level of risk. It's not guaranteeing um, a, a specific outcome. So what else can we say? And just finishing up here, well, uh, the other one that's uh, been talked about a little bit recently is whether we could sample fluid from the blastocele cavity. Uh, here's a, a movie that was done by Maurizio Poli uh, in Oxford uh, just showing this process. It's a, a process where you don't uh, need to have a laser or anything like that, and uh, really anyone who's ICSI trained could potentially do this kind of procedure, um, essentially just piercing through the zona pellucida mechanically and drawing out some of the fluid. And as you can see, the blastocyst collapsing there. Now, if you just leave this blastocyst, it will re-expand by itself very happily. If you vitrify it, of course, there's some quite good evidence to suggest that collapsing the blastocyst like this actually improves vitrification success rates too. So it seems to be a pretty harmless and potentially useful procedure. Um, there was a, a nice paper by Polini and colleagues just recently that showed that you could get genetic information from that fluid. There seems to be free-floating DNA in some of these fluid samples, and we were able to get some array CGH results from them. However, I do have to say to you that several groups have tried to repeat this, and we've done several uh, more uh, ex experiments ourselves, and very often it doesn't work. Now, that may be because our techniques aren't very good yet and we need to optimize them more to make it more robust and reliable. Or it may be that sometimes embryos just don't have this DNA in that fluid. So it remains to be seen. But it's kind of an interesting thing. And maybe if it doesn't work on the DNA level, maybe it will be useful on the omics level because whatever is in there isn't contaminated by the medium. It's purely embryonic stuff. So well, I think it's worth keeping an eye on. So just to conclude, um, I think we've got some very powerful methods at our disposal now, and that's a trend that's continuing to develop. We can look at all 24 chromosomes. The accuracy rates from multiple follow-up studies seem to be very good. Uh, it's possible that this may reduce the risks of miscarriage, Down syndrome. It'd be surprising if it didn't, and hopefully improve IVF success rates. Um, the results can be obtained within 24 hours. Even the next generation sequencing method I showed, uh, we were able to complete within about 16 hours. So it's possible to do with a fresh transfer if you so desire. Um, as I mentioned, accuracy rates seem to be high and the costs of tests are falling, uh, which hopefully will increase patient access to this. Um, I think I'll just leave it at that, but uh, just to thank you again for your attention and also to acknowledge my group back in Oxford uh, and our collaborators, particularly at the uh, Biomedical Research Centre uh, and uh, our IVF collaborators too. Thanks very much.